Our Father, we remember tonight that Christ did die for us. We thank Thee that He hung on the tree and stayed there even though the angels were ready to rescue Him because He loved us and He was willing to pay the price for our redemption. Now Matthew, the 26th chapter, says, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. I want you to see this picture tonight, because the last 24 hours in the life of Christ was the darkest period in the history of the entire world. Many people write to me and they say, we don't understand the gospel. We don't understand what you mean by receiving Christ or being born again. They don't understand why Christ had to die on the cross in order for us to be saved. They do not understand why Christ voluntarily laid down his life. They do not understand why he endured the shame of the cross. And they wonder why that's in the Bible and why so much stress is placed upon the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. These last 24 hours in the life of Christ were the darkest in history and yet it was the darkness just before the dawn. I believe that history repeats itself. And when the world comes to that moment of despair, that moment when it's about to blow itself apart, that moment when it seems there is no solution, at that moment, the sun will rise. The kingdom of God shall come because we have the promise in the scripture that Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, is coming back to this earth again. Ready for the word this morning? Today's message is entitled The Road to the Cross, and we're looking at part two of the series entitled Jesus Ministry. We want to look at Jesus' ministry. And, I, and, and you know something? It's important to me as a pastor to encourage people to grow in love with Jesus, to become passionate about the person of Christ, and to discover who he is. And to find out what he's done for you. Because Jesus is real. He's relatable. And he's relational. And he's relevant for your life right now. Some people regulate him as a religious figure in our history, in the history of mankind. But he's much more than that. He's a personal savior who's interested in your life more than you realize. And so my question is, have you met him? Do you know him? Because if you've not met him, if you don't know him, our hope is that today would be your day and moment to encounter him. And so, traditionally, the church celebrates Palm Sunday this week. It's the week before Easter. And it really commemorates the triumphant entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. And what's so ironic about this event here, all the people in the city of Jerusalem were celebrating and praising Jesus as he entered into the city on the, on, on riding on a colt, on a donkey. And it was only a few days later where the same city was shouting, crucify him. And Jesus was nailed to the cross where he died for your sins and my sins. And so what a twist, a turn of events. Praised and worshipped and celebrated one week and the very next week. He's in the tomb, but then he's raised from the dead again. So 
I want you to, it's very interesting. Uh, Jeff started the service this morning uh, sharing Hebrews 3.8. And Ben shared that verse during the greeting. And none of us planned this, but that is the opening scripture that I want to direct you to. Hebrews 13.8. We're going to read this and then we're going to pray. Hebrews 13.8 states, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. It's important to realize that the road to the cross was set in motion before the world was formed. Long before he was born into this world, God had a plan and had determined that he would be the Savior. And we understand that he hasn't changed his heart, his attitude, his purpose, his perspective. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to minister your word. We thank you for giving us wisdom, insight, and understanding as we discover, Father, the journey of Jesus that led to the cross and what he accomplished for us in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We thank you, Father, and we give you praise and glory and honor. Amen. You know, our desire at Refuge is that you become more acquainted with Jesus, that you grow to know him and experience him more and more. See, he's full of love and compassion for everyone in this place, as well as those that are outside these four walls. I believe everyone in this community is a target of God's love. And see, as, as you, you carry the love of God in you, when you receive the love of God, you receive the capacity to love others as God loves you. And that's an awesome revelation. So in this series on the road to the cross, we started with Jesus' baptism. And what an awesome service. Last Sunday, we had a number of people water baptized to hear their testimonies. We're so moving of what Jesus did in their lives to bring freedom and deliverance and to bring them into a place of, of wholeness in him. Now, we understand that uh, as we look at this aspect of this series, uh, Jesus' ministry, we understand that Jesus began his earthly ministry after his baptism. Uh, and after, he ret- after his baptism, he went into the wilderness to pray, to see God. There he was tempted by the devil. He came out of that wilderness and he began his earthly ministry. There's no recorded sign, miracle, or wonder that Jesus performed before he actually started his ministry after his baptism and after his journey into the wilderness. That's when we began to see Scripture note the miracles, signs, and the ministry of Jesus to the world. And so we understand that there's a starting place for all of us. Our life is a journey. And our destination is determined by choices that we make in this life. Would you agree with that? In Luke chapter 3, verse 23, the scripture reads, the first part of this verse says, Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age. I can remember when I turned 30. And when I turned 30, I I was actually in the ministry for four years because I started pastoring at the age of 26. But when I turned 30, I, I reflect on the fact that Jesus started his ministry at the age of 30. So I was expecting maybe a greater anointing or, or God to do something more in my life. I don't know if anything actually happened different when I turned 30. Uh, I was just older, that's all. And now I look back, that was um, almost 32 years ago. So I'm aging with grace. Anyway, Jesus' ministry, however, was only for three and a half years. And when we realize what he accomplished in that space of time, it's absolutely incredible how he changed the world in three and a half years when he came to visit this planet the first time. And we understand he's coming again. But next time when he comes, he's going to stay a little bit longer, okay? And so we anticipate and look forward to the return of Christ to this earth. Now, in Matthew 4.17, and I'm going to give you a number of scriptures so that we can have reference points in understanding the ministry of Jesus Christ in this earth. Now, let me also prefix this. Jesus' ministry is still ongoing today. So we will be uh, just addressing what he accomplished 
when he walked this earth in that space of three and a half years uh, in his, for his earthly ministry. Because there is a present day ministry of Jesus Christ. And we need to understand that that present day ministry is carried out through you and through me because God is working in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. He's working through you to extend his love, his mercy, and the truth of the gospel to a lost and a dying world. Okay? So Matthew 4, 17, we see from that time, this is after he came out of the wilderness, from that time Jesus began to preach, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, repent simply means to change your ways, change your mind, change your direction. And uh, the kingdom of heaven is in reference to the influence of God coming to earth. And, and, and put your hand out there. Just, everybody put your hand out there just like that. What's at hand? Whatever is at hand is within your grasp. So anytime you see that phrase, something that's at hand is within your grasp. So Jesus is coming. He's saying what is coming so close to this earth is heaven. Heaven's going to become tangible, and you're going to experience God's kingdom influence in your lives. So he began to preach and proclaim that message, okay? Now Jesus ministered to great crowds as well as to his 12 disciples and also individually in one-on-one encounters. But we understand I'm going to share with you three uh, points today. I've got the three points down here. Jesus' ministry consisted primarily of three things. Now, we understand there's so much more that we could talk about that he accomplished, but I want to address three important aspects of his earthly ministry. So, number one, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. His ministry consisted of preaching and teaching. So, preaching and teaching. Now, I like to explain this because... Uh, There's a difference between preaching and teaching. To preach is to proclaim a truth. To teach is to explain a truth. And so I'm more of a teacher because I spend more time explaining a truth than what I do proclaiming a truth. And to preach is wonderful because it's a proclamation. There's a strong anointing. There's a declaration. And the word is going forth in a powerful way to impact lives. But then when it comes to teaching, it's usually after preaching because then it's trying to figure out, okay, how do you live out this life? How do you walk this out? We need to be taught. We need to be trained. We need to be instructed. That's why we have schools on this earth. We need to be taught. We need teaching. Okay? But yet, we need both. And we see that here. Jesus was, came preaching and teaching. Okay? Now Luke chapter 20, verse 1. And we see this. Reference here, one day, say one day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priest and the scribes with the elders came up. In other words, he began to stir up a crowd, but also the religious leaders caught wind of what he was saying, so they came to check this guy out. Now notice the scripture reads that he was teaching the people in the temple. He was giving them explanation of things, and also he was preaching the gospel. Now, what is the gospel? See, our church formerly, before we relaunched in uh, 2015, was called Good News Fellowship Church. And, and the, the word gospel simply means good news, okay? Good news. It's, see, it, it means it's, it's good news for everyone. So when you hear the word gospel, it's good news. It's not bad news. It's not, oh, this is a bummer. It's not something that's going to put you down and wipe you out or destroy you. It's something that's going to pick you up, give you life, and restore you, okay? And so we understand the gospel is good news. And so Jesus was preaching a message of good news that excited the people. They said, this is what we need. We are bound in our sins. We are oppressed. We are sick. We're afflicted. We're oppressed by the Roman Empire. And all these things were going wrong in their life. And Jesus coming and giving them a message of hope, a message of good news, something they could get a hold of that could transform their lives. And so uh, Jesus revealed who he was and what he came to do. And with this first point, I believe it's important to understand 
In Jesus' preaching and teaching, he revealed who he was, the Savior of the world, that he came to save the lost. Now, it's also important, uh, there's a couple of scriptures we can uh, share relating to that. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, and he was addressing one of his disciples, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. There's no other Savior. There's no other one that can bring you to the Father. And so Jesus was identifying himself as the way, the truth, and the life for all of humanity. Now, some people, maybe in some circles and other religions, have an issue with that because they have an issue with Jesus. And they think there's many ways, but there's only one way. There may be other gods or people see as saviors, but there's only one who was raised from the dead. There's only one who's living and alive. And so we could say more about that, but I like John 10.10 10 too because Jesus also identifies here what he came for. John 10.10 10 says the thief comes, that's in reference to the enemy, only to steal and kill and destroy. In fact, that's the devil's mission statement right there. The devil's mission statement is to steal, to kill, and destroy. But the second part of that verse reads, Jesus states his mission statement. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now, you can read this in other translations, and this word actually means to have life as God experiences it, life at a different level. Because life doesn't have to be a bummer for you. Life doesn't have to be a burnout. Life doesn't have to be a pain and a heartache. You can begin to experience the very life of God in you, his life, okay? So Jesus came that you might have life and have it abundantly, an overflowing amount. When you have something in abundance, that means it's, it's, you have more than enough. And God wants to infuse you with his life which with it comes peace, joy, hope. Every attribute of God's nature is involved with his life. Number two, um, when we look at what Jesus came to do, what his ministry consisted of, his ministry also consisted of, number two, ministry to the sick and afflicted and those that were oppressed by demons. So number two, Ministry to the sick and afflicted and those who were oppressed by demons. So we also see that Jesus, in this second aspect of his ministry, is the healer. He's the healer of broken lives, the healer of broken homes, the healer of those that are afflicted with sickness and disease and oppressed by demonic uh, opposition and oppression. There are actually 197 scriptures in the ESV version of the Bible that refer or reference healing in both the Old and the New Testament, 78 in the Old and 119 in the New. What's interesting, uh, a study of the scriptures gives us a clear understanding of where God's heart is on this subject. And what his will is on this subject. I believe wrong teaching has hurt the church on the subject of healing. Because just because somebody uh, is sick, sometimes people think, okay, God put that sickness on them. Or God is afflicting that on them. But yet, if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if Jesus is the will of God in action. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What did Jesus do? What did he accomplish that reveals the heart of God? And Jesus spent a considerable amount of his time healing the sick and afflicted. And, and now we, we might ask the question, why did Jesus heal? Was it to prove that he was the son of God? Or was it to demonstrate his power? No, the answer is no to both of those questions. Now, that might have some relevance. The reason Jesus healed was because his compassion for the people. He had compassion for hurting people in their suffering. That's why Jesus healed the sick, because of compassion and his love that compelled them to do something about their affliction. Now, whether it was to feed the multitudes because they were suffering from hunger, or was it to, was it to shepherd those who were harassed and helpless like, 
those without a shepherd. We see that in Matthew 9.36. Or to heal the oppressed who were oppressed with sickness and disease. In all those cases, it was because of his compassion. His compassion motivated and moved him to do something about their issue. We understand that people can have sympathy for someone, but sympathy is just, oh, I feel sorry for you. But compassion takes sympathy to another level because compassion says, I'm going to do something to help you. I'm moved and motivated to, to do something to make a difference in your life. And that's what Jesus did. He was moved with compassion. We see that in Matthew 14, 14. He had crossed the Sea of Galilee. And the scripture says, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. They were anticipating him coming. They heard, they got wind. Jesus is coming to this side. And so when he got over there, notice what it says, the last part of the verse. And he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Wow. In Jeremiah 30, verse 17, we see even in the Old Testament that what God's heart was concerning healing. Jeremiah 30, 17 says, For I will restore health to you and your wounds. I will heal, declares the Lord. That was the declaration to the prophet Jeremiah concerning the heart of God to to those that were sick and afflicted. And then we have Acts 10.38. I love this passage because this kind of gives a synopsis of Jesus' healing ministry. And let's look look at it and see what it says. Acts 10.38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. So sickness, we can come to a conclusion that it, at least in this passage, is oppression by the devil. The devil oppresses people with sickness and disease. And Jesus came to heal those who were oppressed by the devil. We see another passage in Matthew 8, 14 and 17. I'm, I hope I'm not overloading you with scripture today. But you know what? You can't go wrong when you share the Bible. Because the Bible is truth. Amen? We see the truth. We see God's word. So Matthew 8, verses 14 through 17, we see in this passage as well. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. Now, uh, Peter must have been married because he had a mother-in-law. But anyway, um, she wasn't feeling too good. Jesus walks in. He's got a fever. Notice verse 15. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose up and began to serve him. I just want to pause on a moment. What's interesting about this, that immediately she began to serve once she was healed. And we need to understand that if you have a physical infirmity that's holding you back, that's preventing you from serving the purpose of God, one of the reasons that we receive healing is so that we can serve Because when we're sick and afflicted, it's it's a little more challenging. But when we're healthy and whole, then we we can be a whole lot more involved in serving and making a difference. And I'm not saying that you can't serve if you are dealing with sickness and infirmity, because you certainly can. But it's a whole lot easier when you're healthy and strong. Would you agree? Okay. Now, in verse 16, it goes on to say, That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. One of the redemptive aspects we need to understand that occurred when Jesus went to the cross, he took, he bore our sicknesses, and he took our infirmities so that we could receive healing. So the price was paid through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. We need to understand that truth. See, Jesus not only healed the sick, but he also commissioned us to do as well. We see in Matthew 10, 8, where Jesus said, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, freely you receive, freely give. So Jesus empowered his disciples. And then in Matthew 16, or Mark Chapter 16, 18, and Jesus said, These signs shall follow those who believe in my name. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So part of our commission and mission is to pray for the sick. And if there's any sick or afflicted here today at the end of the service, we'll have the prayer team up here, and we invite you to come and, and receive prayer for healing. 
And, and I believe God will meet you at your point of need. Number three, the third aspect of Jesus' ministry is restoring dominion. Restoring dominion. And see, we understand that he is our soon coming king. He is going to return to this earth. We understand that the fall of mankind, when Adam sinned in the garden, the fall stripped man of his dominion that we see that was given to man in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, uh, 26 through 28, we see where uh, man was given dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air. He was basically put in charge of this earth. But because of the fall, that dominion was lost, and Satan became the ruler or the god of this age or the god of this world system. And that's when oppression, sickness, disease, and heartache, and murder, and every evil thing came upon this planet after dominion was lost. In Luke chapter 19.10, and you've probably heard this scripture many times. It says for the, in the uh, New King James uh, version reads this way, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, you know, I used to think that this was only in reference to lost souls, lost people. But we need to understand that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's in reference to everything that was lost because of the fall, man's dominion, the kingdom of God's influence and God's right and rule on this earth. Because of the losing, lost dominion, sin and Satan became dominant in the lives and the hearts of, of mankind. And, and we, we don't have time to narrate some of the history of you know, the time of Noah's flood when the world was destroyed because of its wickedness and different things. And God promised that would never happen again. But, but we see the effect of the lost dominion um, in the earth. In Acts chapter 3, verses 19 through 21, also in the New King James Bible, we read a very interesting passage. And first of all, we understand that this was the day uh, Peter is preaching. And there's a crowd of people that have gathered around. And he says, repent, therefore, and be converted. He's calling people to come to Christ. That your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Verse 20, and that he may send Jesus, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. Now, I want to just give a little bit about this passage because there's a couple of things we need to see and understand. Notice the phrase, the times of restoration of all things. God is restoring things. He's restoring man's dominion in the earth. He's restoring God's kingdom influence in this earth. We see this passage speaking, first of all, of conversion, coming to Christ, forgiveness of sins, and refreshment that comes from God's presence in our life. And part of this is seeing that Jesus wants to come and make himself real in your life. And, but we know that he's also coming again. He's physically going to return to this planet. And he's going to establish his physical kingdom where he will be the ruler of the nations of the world. He is coming back just as he came the first time. And we have that as a historic record. He is surely and certainly coming back again. And so we understand this. So what does restoration include It includes God's kingdom influence upon this planet in our individual lives, our dominion, so that we can walk in the authority that God has granted us. We understand that we have authority over Satan. It's restoration of our position as God's sons and daughters to be in right relationship with him so that we can accomplish his will. And we see in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and and after they went out and they began to minister, they gathered back together, and they were talking about how they were being used of God to minister to hurting people. And, And Jesus said, Behold, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Wow. Now, the Greek word for restoration 
in what we saw in Acts is actually a word that implies a return to formal, original, normal, or unimpaired condition, or the restitution of something taken away or that which was lost. That's what that Greek word means, restoration. So Jesus came to accomplish uh, these three aspects, the preaching and teaching of the word, the ministry of healing to the sick and the afflicted and those oppressed by demons, and then also the restoration of dominion. And I want to conclude with a verse here for these, for these three points. We see in Romans 5:17. if you have your Bibles turned there, in the English Standard Version, it's important to see this passage because it kind of narrates uh, and encompasses so much of what happened uh, in human history. And, and so Romans 5.17 says, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Who's that one man? It's referring to Adam. Because of Adam's sin, death reigned through that one man. But then it says, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Realize this, and the worship team can come on up here. Realize this, that God has made it possible in restoring dominion for you and I to reign in this life. So that we don't have to let the condition. Is this one on? All right. Well, that's a good uh, sign that uh, service time is coming to an end here. My time is up. <laughs> All right. Let me put that there. I want to read this passage one more time. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. How can we reign in life? It's through Jesus. He's called us to reign with him as his sons and daughters so that the circumstances, the oppression, the fear, the hatred, and all those negative things don't have to reign over us, but we can reign over them through the power of Jesus. And so we understand that there's a free gift of righteousness that's extended to us. And that gift of righteousness simply is a gift to live life the way God intended us to, with his nature, with his life, so that we can live out this life to fulfill what he's called us to do. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, the scripture reads, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Are you here today and you say, Pastor, I know I'm saved without a doubt. I've given my heart to Jesus Christ. I've come to him and I've dedicated my heart and life to him. That's wonderful. But maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, I'm not certain about where my life is at. I have not really given my heart to Jesus Christ. Or, or maybe you have some time ago and, and now you kind of drifted away and you're not really walking with God. He's not really first in your life. And yet today you're here and God's tugging at your heart and say, son, daughter, come home. And we, we see that there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. You might say, I, I just want to, I want to share this. You, you might be here today and you say, you know, 
I don't know if I'm ready to be saved. I don't know if I want to be saved. I don't know if I want to give my heart to Christ. Those are great questions to ask. But my question for you is, is there any reason why you wouldn't want to give your heart to Jesus? Because if you don't have any real reason not to, why not give your heart to him today? Why not open yourself up to him today? Because he wants to infuse your life with his love. He wants to reveal himself. He wants you to experience his forgiveness so that your sins and the influence of that sin can be eradicated from your life so you don't have to be under the power of sin's control anymore. You can be set free by his power. No counseling can counsel away addiction, but Jesus can take it away. Now, counseling has a place, but to really be delivered, Jesus is the deliverer. To really be set free, Jesus is the only one that can really set you free. I'm going to read this. I was thinking about saving it for next week, but this is going to give you a picture of Jesus. What can we say about Jesus? Jesus Christ, Savior, he offered himself as a sacrifice. Jesus Christ, Savior, became man's substitute. Jesus Christ, Savior, came to earth to set us free. He is our healer and deliverer. Jesus Christ became mediator between God and man. Jesus Christ bore the sins of many. Jesus Christ carried the burdens of humanity. Jesus Christ is the only foundation that will stand. Jesus Christ, our Savior, all hope of eternal life is built upon Him. Jesus Christ, Savior, His sacrificial death is the central theme of preaching. Jesus Christ, Savior, the only source of truth and the author of life. Jesus Christ, our Savior, is our intercessor. He's the only Redeemer. He's the only re remedy, the only Savior. He alone is the author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus Christ, Savior. Rejection of Him means death. Jesus Christ, Savior, He is the only saving name. Jesus Christ is the gift of love. Go ahead and bow your heads if you would. And at this time, I want to extend an invitation for those of you that don't know Jesus. And you say, Pastor, I'm ready and willing to surrender my heart and my life to Him today to receive his love, to receive his forgiveness, and to let him change me into the person he wants me to be. If that's you this morning, I want you just to slip up your hand and say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I know my life is not right with God, and I'm ready to surrender today. I'm ready to give my heart today. Can I see that hand? Are there others? Thank you. Thank you. Let's stand together, and thank you for raising your hand. Thank you for acknowledging your need for Jesus. He's going to meet you today. He's going to reveal himself to you today because he's real. I want you to bow your heads as we pray. As we pray. And we're going to pray. I'm going to lead you in what I call a believer's prayer. It's simply a prayer that we can pray to receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior and accept his forgiveness into our lives. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I open up my heart and my life to you. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. I repent. I turn from my sins and I give my heart to you. Make my life what you want it to be. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you died for my sins and you rose from the dead to give me life. I receive you now in Jesus' name. If you're here today and you need healing in your physical body, Jesus is the healer. He's not only the Savior, but he's the healer. Just lift your hand right where you're at. Okay? You need healing in your body. I'm going to pray for you. Father, I thank you. And I pray that you would extend your hand to heal and deliver. 
Jesus, we acknowledge you as the same yesterday, today, and forever. When you walked this earth, you healed all that were sick, those that were afflicted, those that were oppressed. Lord, I pray even now that your healing power would be extended upon this congregation to minister to the afflictions and the sicknesses that they bear. In Jesus' name, we acknowledge, Jesus, that you bore our sickness. You carried our disease. You took them to the cross as our substitute so that we could be healed, so that we could be made whole. I speak healing now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise. Thank you, Father. We're going to worship God in a song, and then the prayer team is going to be up here in a little bit. Anyone needing prayer, if you lay, raise your hand to receive Christ, if you also would like more prayer for healing, I prayed a general prayer, but maybe you would want hands laid on you. Uh, you can come forward for that as well. Or if you have any other need and would like us to join our faith with you, we're here to pray with you, to ask for prayer. There's nothing wrong. Don't be too proud to ask for prayer. We see that as a, a privilege and as an opportunity for all of us. Thank you so much. Let's worship God together. Thank you for being so attentive to his word.